You know, one of the most famous passages in the Bible is Psalm 23. And it seems like no matter what TV show that you watch at someone's funeral or hospital side, you know, they're reading Psalm 23. Or, you know, they're very careful about what parts of the Bible they'll let you even hear on TV. But Psalm 23 is usually include, included in there. J.R. Church, years ago, wrote a book on the Psalms. And a lot of people don't realize the significance of the Psalms. But the Bible said in Luke, it said that that day, speaking of the day of the Lord, would not come except all in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms be fulfilled. And so when you start looking at the Psalms, and he does something kind of analytical with the book of Psalms, a lot of people don't realize too that each chapter in Psalms has an umbilical cord somewhere in the Bible. And that's why it's included there. And so he did a time frame thing on the thing and he started looking and noticing the correlation historically, the correlation of the chapters of Psalms with, with human history. And it was amazing. I'm not saying he's entirely accurate on everything, but... Uh, I love those things that make you really dig deeper, look at things, and take that second look, that third look, and go, what's going on, all right? And uh, so I want to start a, a series. I, I wrote everybody about it yesterday. We're going to take the next seven weeks, and we're going to look at each of the verses of the Psalms. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that hearts would be open to you and that your spirit would be welcome here today. I pray that as our Bibles are opened, Lord, as we speak your word today and as we preach and teach to your people, Father, that lives would be changed. Lord, we need our lives to be changed. We need to be more like you. But God, I know that you want to be welcome to do so. And so, Father, I pray that our hearts would be open, open and you would be welcome today and your spirit would be here, Father, to comfort, to convict, and to speak to us, Lord, the things that we need. In Jesus' name, and the people said, Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 23, let's just read uh, those verses this morning, verses 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love the King James. I love the accuracy of the King James. I love the way that it differentiates on words. Some of you may understand why I use the King James. I don't worship the King James. I, but I love, it. to me, it's one of the most accurate. But I want to read something to you that someone else wrote in definition of that, if I could. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green pastures. He leads me to calm water. He gives me new strength. He leads me on paths that are right for the good of His name. And even if I walk through a dark valley, I'll not be afraid because you are with me. Your rod and your shepherd's staff comfort me. You prepare a meal for me in front of mine enemies. You pour oil of blessing on my head. You fill my cup to overflowing 
Surely your goodness and love will be with me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. We can go through different versions. We could do all kinds of things this morning, but I'm telling you that is a powerful, powerful psalm. The problem is we get what's called gospel hardened. How many of you have ever heard that phrase? Raise your hand. We get scripture hardened, gospel hardened. That means that something happens in the brain, a disconnect, and that is that when we hear a verse so many times, the brain clicks it off. Give you a good analogy of that. Growing up, you would hear your mom's voice or your dad's voice, and at a certain stage, you know, you're no longer hearing it. It's just in your head. And even though this word is alive, if we're not careful, talking about the soul of our heart, when we hear God's Word being preached, or we hear a familiar passage in Scripture, after we've heard it two or three times, we can discard it in our mind. And when we do that, it doesn't continue to grow and to develop in our heart. We need to, that's why the Bible said to meditate on the Word. You meditate on it. You memorize it. You go over Scripture in your mind and say, Lord, give me another nugget from that. And that's what I want to do with you this morning. We're living in a world today that's wanting remedies. I don't care what channel you turn it on to. I don't care what magazine you pick up, even in the newspapers. I don't care where you go on the internet. Everybody's got a remedy for everything. It's turned into a trillion dollar a year industry USD. Bet the doctors never saw that coming. And so people are getting more into natural medicine. They're getting into those things. And you would think that that would create a generation of people when they wanted the natural things would be open to God. But it's not necessarily that way. They're looking for physical remedies for almost anything from the common cold to different strains of flu, now COVID-19, and all the variants, if you've kept up with it. Diabetes. I I'm amazed. Every day I open up something and it'll say, if you'll try this, if you know anyone with diabetes, if they'll do this for 10 nights, their diabetes will go away. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you've seen those things. They're on Facebook all the time. Muscle diseases and almost every other ailment there is. And, and, and the, good, the, the reason is because our world is full of disease. As humanity goes along, there is what is called the second law of thermodynamics. Anyone ever hear of that? It, it means this. It's one of the laws of thermodynamics, and it means that everything is in a constant state of decay. Guess what? Our world is decaying. You're never going to put that toothpaste back in the, you know, it's not going back in. It is decaying. Well, so is our DNA. And as we go along, the more diseases that come along, the more things that are happening, well, we're going to see more of it. But a lot of the diseases that we're dealing with today, do you realize are exacerbated and brought on early in life or brought on period because of stress? Doctors agree on this. Across the board, they agree. Yes, some things are genetical. Yes, they can be brought on early by stress. Okay? Do you realize the human body, the mind, and the spirit were never designed to deal with stress? It wasn't the original part of the design. And largely as a result of the modern day stresses we're dealing with in this fallen world that we live in now, it has a huge amount of effect on physical symptoms and ailments in our life. Imagine what it'd be like if we were still in the garden, walking with the Lord in the cool of each evening, no curse, no enemy, no pressures, no financial strain, no sin, no worries. Yeah, I know. Brings a chuckle. Here we go. Yeah, right. I was talking with someone uh, just this morning, and I said, how you guys doing? And they said, so busy. And I said, you know, when we were younger, we thought when we got older, things would slow down. But that's not true, is it? 
That's where I develop the say when people say, I have been so busy, I look at them, I say, I'd like to tell you that gets better. But it doesn't. And so we get busier and busier and busier because we're in those producing time or that producing time of our life and time just gets stolen from us. All right? In this series, we're going to deal with seven of the greatest stresses. And stress is defined as pressures, anxiety, tension, and strain. Narrowed it down like that because I thought everything else comes underneath there. And we're going to study these things. We're going to study today. We're going to look at worry. All right? Do you know that Psalm 23 deals with worry? And busyness, emotional damage, indecisions, dark valleys, hurts and disappointments, and the future. God's Word deals with that too. And all of those are found in Psalm 23 and their remedies and cures. And we read it and we think, that's just a beautiful psalm. We're reading it. It's supposed to comfort us, and so on and so forth. And I promise you, I'm not mocking you, but I'm amazed when we look at this stuff that we don't see more. So let's see some more this morning. It tells us what God's really like. It gives us a picture of God in that one psalm. And my goal for the series is threefold. I, I want you to know what God is like. I want you to know how much He really loves you. If I were to take a survey today and you were to have private notes and you wrote on this and I've done this before and I said, how many of you realize how much God loves you? And you know, I was amazed when I got all the responses back in one seminar and I would say 75% of the people said no. And I want you to know how much you really matter to him. Satan does everything he can to separate us from the Father. But the more you understand God, the easier it's going to be for you to trust him. So we want you to understand God in as much as he's given us to understand. The first cause of stress we're going to look at this morning is worry. Anybody in here ever worry? Yeah? Yeah? And, uh, you know, Corey Ten Boom said this. She said, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of sorrows. It empties today of strength. That is so true, isn't it? It doesn't take care of anything. Worry never helped anything. As a matter of fact, did you realize that research so shows this? 97% of the things that we worry about and we're afraid of never come true. Mm. And everyone's got pet worries, whether it be finances, job, relationship, kids, marriage, health, no matter what it is, everybody's got worries. And there, there's three problems with worry. First one is, it's unhelpful. Boy, my worry really took care of that. I was glad I was worried, and I go around teaching seminars. Can you imagine someone standing and saying, I teach seminars on how to worry about things. Because they help people, right? Never happen. Worry never accomplishes anything, never solves anything. It's like racing your car engine. You create a lot of smoke, a lot of noise, and go nowhere. Okay? Worry has never solved a problem. It only makes a miserable day. It's unhelpful. It, this is profound, doesn't work. It enslaves us. Okay? And secondly, it's unreasonable. Worry is unreasonable. It exaggerates your problems. It makes mountains out of molehills. And the more you review, review something, uh, the, the more you're worried, the bigger it gets, the more paranoid we become. Uh, you know, I remember going to some preacher's meetings. I'm just going to say it. I used to go to some preacher meetings. Brother Bill know what I'm talking about. And I'd come out of there wondering some of those guys, the messages they preached, which one of my people was going to come after me. And I quit going to them. I said, I want to love my people. <laughs> and some things started changing too, all right? <laughs> to worry about something you can't change is a waste of time and it's useless. And to worry about something you can change 
is stupid. I know, speakers aren't supposed to use words like that, right? It's stupid. Something you can change, there's no need to worry about it. Go change it. Do something about it. Number three, it's unhealthy. The body wasn't made to worry. It's unnatural. And when you worry, you get ulcers, backaches, headaches, insomnia. And our bodies just weren't equipped for that. Plants and animals don't worry. The only thing in all of God's creation that worries are humans. They worry. Okay? The old English word for worry is the word, are you ready for this? To strangle or choke. That's insightful, isn't it? And that's what worry does. It strangles the life out of you. You weren't born worrying. You have to learn how to worry. Now, there's good news in that analysis. Because if you can learn to worry, you can unlearn. And that's what God's Word's there for. And I want to give you three remedies for worry this morning. And, and I'm, I'm not stupid on this. I know people write this down. And, you know, they'll go, okay, well, those three things make sense. We're not here just to preach a message. You know the Bible refers to a pastor as an apothecary? We have people in this church group that are going through tremendous trials. Unbearable trials that they're going through right now. And this is meant as an apothecary. How many of you know what an apothecary is? Raise your hand. It's a healer. It's a biblical word. And so... When I get up to preach, even Brother Graham teaching, or someone gets up here, they're an apothecary. You need to look at them that way and think of them that way as they're administering God's Word to the soul, to the spirit, to the mind. So you really need to focus on the things that are being taught. And you know, I've said this before, I want to reiterate it this morning to make this point. Think what Christians' lives would be like today if they took every message and applied that from that day forward to the rest of their life, what would our lives be like? Well, it'd be a little bit of heaven on earth. Amen? Three remedies I want to give you for worry that I have had to teach myself, I have to practice in my own life, and that is, number one, you've got to believe that God will take care of me. You know one of the neat things about getting older, having been saved when you were younger? I can look back over my life and see that he's never forsaken me. He's always taken care of me. No matter what trials, times that I have literally despaired of life. How many of you understand what I just said? That God has taken care of it every single time. God, not me, God has taken care of it. And that's what God wants to let us do. Psalm 23, 1, The Lord is my shepherd. Underline the word shepherd. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Now because he's my shepherd, I shall not want. You know what that means? I don't have need for anything. <laughs> I laugh horrible. I've watched myself laugh on video and it's horrible. So, Lord bless you for putting up with it. But I just find it so humorous, you know, that we as humans, we worry as Christians, children of God, we can worry about things when God says, hey, look, I'll take care of that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Okay? If I believe God's going to take care of me, I'm not going to worry. So when we're worrying, we need to realize what's really happening with us. Is it natural to worry? Let's just get this elephant out of the room. Yes, it's natural. But when we get saved, God's putting His super on our natural. And we're able to deal with things. So if I let the Lord be my shepherd, how is it? that I have a remedy to worry. Well, 
You have to know what shepherds do according to God's word. Number one, a shepherd provides. He protects. He guides. And he corrects. When he's providing, he provides food, shelter, the basic necessities of his sheep. Well, look at here. God provides. <laughs> I can't deny. All the things that I have ever needed in my life, my shepherd has taken care of. And he protects. He defends against enemies and harm. I'm going to make a statement that I've never made from my pulpit before, and I'm going to say this to you. I have buried enemies. Not because Dalton Walker is great. Not because Dalton Walker is flawless or any of those things. Dalton Walker is probably the most flawed human being, but I'm telling you, when we let God take care of things and people come against us, wrongly for what God has had us do, God takes care of even our enemies. That's His Word. That's His Word. I remember late one night, I had been going through a trial for about two years. My wife was with me. I got a phone call. And it was this person that had caused some of the greatest grief in my life and we prayed for them daily. Not trying to be super spiritual with you or anything else, but I'm telling you, we left it before God. You know what we did during that time? Nothing. No retaliation, no words of meanness, no ugliness, because God led us to do that. God impressed us that He would take care of this, but He had lessons for us to learn along the way. And you know, I was there that night, got that phone call, and they said, this gentleman has just dropped dead. Immediately in my heart, there was no joy. There was nothing like that. But I thought, oh God, <laughs> great is our Lord. Amen? He protects, he defends against enemies and harm. People that would go against your name, look out. Let your God defend you though and not you. Let God do it. Number three, he guides. He leads his sheep when they're confused and they don't know which way to go. My mentor, Dr. Bert Harrison, taught me this principle in the first week. He said, When you don't know what to do, don't do anything. There's a 50% chance you're going to make a mistake. And he said, because when you don't know what to do, it's clear God hadn't shown you. Some of you are in limbo right now. God's got you there. And it's one of those times where God works on us. And he's doing other things. And a shepherd corrects. Any problem that comes along, God corrects it. The amazing thing is this. God promised to do those four things in your life if you let him shepherd you. If you let him shepherd you, okay? He says, I'll provide for you, protect you, guide you, correct the problems in your life for you if you'll let me be your shepherd. Okay, Isaiah 40 and verse 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather his lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. He gets even more specific in the book of Philippians in chapter 4 and verse 19. He said, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, all your need. You say, I have a family need. He'll supply that. I have a finance need. I can't tell you how many times God has supplied for us financially when no one else knew what the situation was and God did something to take care of the finances. You're looking for a mate. God will take care of that. Normally when we try to, 
It's a disaster. <laughs> Let God take care of those things. The Bible said in, in the book of Genesis, and you go, you're not one of those, are you? Yes, I am. The Bible said that God brought the woman to the man. And there was a message in that, guys. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. All right? It doesn't say he'll meet our greed. There's differences between need and greed. And sometimes God lets us go through the trials so we figure out what things we really need. Kind of like as the week goes on, I have this great big list that I look at and I go, okay, this is Wednesday. I can't get all those things done. I've got to decide which ones I'm going to get done in the next three days. And now it's Friday and I go, okay, well that's out the door. I can't even focus on that this week because to get the... Well, it's that way too with our needs we have. As we go along in life and we review, man, I need this, I need this, I need this. And then it gets down to it and you go, I didn't really need that. <laughs> God's already there. We just need to catch up with it. He said, I'll supply all your need, not the greed. If he met all your wants, you'd be the biggest self-centered person in the universe. When God makes a promise, His character's on the line. I'm praying about something in my life right now. And as I pray about that, I said, Lord, I'm claiming this in Your Word. I'm claiming this in Your Word. I'm claiming this principle that I know is important to You. I'm claiming this that was done wrong. I'm claiming this, Father. I'm reciting to God God's Word that's in my heart. Amen? That's why we need to know God's Word. We need to know the things that are important for Him. So how do I make God my shepherd? Well, first of all, you've got to understand, God is not everybody's shepherd. He wants to be, but He's not everybody's shepherd. So, People that have never accepted Him as their Savior can't have Him as their shepherd, all right? So first of all, you've got to accept Christ as Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. How did He become my shepherd? I accepted His gift, His Son. I have the same blood, spiritually speaking, coursing through my veins now. I'm His and He is mine. Okay? Secondly, stop playing God and let God be God. We're all guilty of that. We've all found ourselves in that place before, and if you haven't, I have. I've found myself so many times in life playing God in my own life, and then I have to back up and I say, Lord, forgive me. This is on you, God. This is on you. Today we might say boss or manager or CEO, but Lord means the person who's calling the shots. Now that is something that is far removed from us from an old English society where they called people lords and it has a bad connotation on it today and I've actually interviewed people and worked with them on the concept of lord. Even boss, CEO, all those things, Satan has made sure they all have a bad connotation today. But I'm going to tell you, the easier it gets easier as time goes by the more you will say, Lord, you are my Lord. You are my King. And your mind and your spirit begin to accept that a little more each time you say that. And it helps your body to get realigned, your, your life to get realigned with God just to acknowledge, Father, you're my Lord. You're my Lord. Tell me what to do, God. And to accept Jesus as Lord means three things, all right? John chapter 10, I'm going to read verse 14, verse 27 to you. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. By hook or crook. You know when the Bible says when the psalmist said thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Do you know what the rod and the staff re represented? How many of you have ever seen a shepherd carrying a lamb? Well, when you talk to shepherds, 
they'll tell you normally that's one they've had to break their leg. And that's what that crook is for. And they would break a, 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 a sheep or a lamb's leg that was always running off. Now, this is old culture, this is Bible culture, you can check it out. They would break that leg. And then they would hold that sheep or that lamb in their arms until that leg healed and by then that sheep got used to the fact this is where safety is. Pretty cool, huh? And it was a rod of correction. And he said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now that lines up with everything else David said too because he said, thy laws are precious to me. He loved the laws of God. All right? And he says in, in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So you know Jesus, you listen to Jesus, and you follow Jesus you put him in control, and he's your shepherd. Now he goes through this whole dialogue in the Bible from beginning to end, and you know there's different classifications of people. There's shepherds, there's sheep, there's goats, there's wolves, and sheepdogs. Oh, I left one out. <laughs> Donkeys or mules. The Lord said, don't be as the mule. <laughs> okay? It's not very complimentary, you know, we wear our feelings today right here. But God used animals a lot of times because they were visible, people, they could easily be seen. People knew the character of them, and he'd say, let me tell you what you're acting like. <laughs> now I know I'm in trouble. Secondly, I must begin praying about everything. When you find that you're not praying as much, I bet if you go back and look and keep a journal on it, it means you're worrying more. Trying to take things in your own hand, figure it out in your own mind, how to do it, so on and so forth. There's an easier way. There's an easier way. You just talk to God. He wants your friendship. He wants your relationship. I had a guy that came to me for counseling one day, and he was a chronic worrier. I never tell any counseling stories that have ever happened in the last 25 years. I always make sure that they're at least 25 years old. So I'm not talking about anybody here, okay? He was a chronic worrier. I asked him if he'd prayed about it. He told me he didn't have time. I told him, but you have time for worry? Worry doesn't change anything. Prayer does. You'll do your greatest work of the day on your knees before God. Spurgeon said, worry and stewing without doing. I kind of like that. Stewing without doing. Prayer puts us in touch with God who can do something about it. When, when I'm worried, I have two options. Panic or pray. If we, you went over the last year of your life, how would you say you have responded to the crises in your life? Hey man, I'm going to tell you something right now. You men need to get a hold of the throne room of God in your lives. If you're not praying for your family, who is? Heard a guy talking about this here not too long ago, but he was so right in it. Men... If you're not praying for your family, who's going to pray? If you're not fasting for your family, who's going to fast for them? If you don't have that relationship with God that you need in your home to take care of your family, who's going to do it? Oh, well, my wife. What a man. Be a spiritual man today, man. Pray. And show your families how to pray. Teach them how to pray. You dads want to teach girls how to look for the right man, let them see you praying. Amen? Involve God in everything that you do. So I have these two options, panic or pray. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. Let it happen. 
Everything, not just religious things. Everything. Why? God's kind of trying to build this bridge to you of intimacy with you where you're a part of every thought. He's a part of every thought in your life. Everything. Most people pray prayers they think God wants to hear. Doesn't work, guys. God sees past that. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. God's ability is better, stronger, more potent than your anxiety. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon Him. Why? For He careth for you. You know, men, we're a different group. We know that. Emotions, we have them, but we bury them. And we bury them with God, too. And guys, I'm just telling you, this, this isn't Father's Day message, but it's, a, it, it's preparing for it. He careth for you. God cares for you. It's an incredible stress reliever. You can cast it on Him, dump it on Him, unload it on Him, and the promise is most of us do casting like we do fishing. We cast it, we reel it back in. God wants you to cast all your care upon Him. And you know what happens? We walk away from prayer and feel like, well, you know, that's too simple. Or we walk away from prayer and we think, well, you know, this is still heavy on my heart. I'm, I'm going to teach you something that I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, I don't agree with that. I'm going to tell you something. Real prayer is this. You come to God, you dump it with Him, and you get up and you walk away. Well, I think that's kind of disrespectful. I think that's kind of, you know, taking things at surface value. You ought to try it sometime. Because you can walk back with that thing in your heart and nothing will change. Act like God will take care of it. Act like He cares about you. Show Him. Get on a different plane of thinking and show Him that you believe that He cares about you. By saying, you know what, Lord? I'm dumping my heart, my mind. It's more than I can handle right here, Lord. I give it to you. And Lord, I'm going to go on and have the kind of day as if you had already taken care of everything. Well, that's a little irreverent, isn't it? No. That's a whole lot faithful. Well, but aren't we supposed to worry about things? Right. Because remember that takes care of things. We have to work actively to connect on a faith level. That's how it's a remedy. When we actively connect on a faith level in our prayer, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Here's my problems. Here's my fears. Here's my anxieties. God, I come today, they boil up inside of me. God, I'm weeping through the night. God, help me! And turn them over to Him. And then train yourself in faith. In faith to get up and walk away and purpose to not think about it. Now you're going to start connecting and depending on God a whole lot more because He can do something about it. You say, that's a big leap. That's what I'm saying. The more we hear about something, some people are gospel hardened today. They hear it and it goes in one ear. They say amen to it. It passes out the other ear. And their life doesn't change. It is an active effort on our part to turn things over to God and then live a life as if they've been turned over to the only one who can change that. And that's where the anxieties get dumped. The fears get dumped. The troubles in our heart. And all the stresses that come along with those things. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. In 
thirdly, I must believe or I must consider one day at a time. One day. Focus, concentrate, and consider one day at a time. Satan's going to stretch you out, and Satan's going to come at you, and you know two weeks from now, three weeks from now, a year from now, you need to be thinking about this right now, and you'll just in knots, twist it up. Pretty soon your drama, I've got to have some time, I've got to do this. I just said that and I'm going away for a few days. Well, I thought you needed a good laugh. God wants to take care of your problems, but if you want to take care of them, He's happy to let you. He'll do it. Matthew 6, 34. Take, therefore, no thought for tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know, man. I'm not sure I can do that. There's the problem. Are you listening to me? There's the problem. There it is. For the moral shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What's got you worried this morning? What trial are you going through in life? And I'm just going to say, most of our people are going through trials right now. Whatever your trial is, you need this message. The Bible tells you that your Heavenly Father already perfectly knows what trial that you're going through, no matter what it is, and already has the remedy for it. He has the solution. You know, if you go home, you read Psalm 23, you'll find that 17 times in six verses the word I, my, or me are used. What does that mean? It means it's intensely personal, like I just got with you this morning. Intensely pur purposeful. He or his is used about seven or ten times. It's about a relationship with God. You need a shepherd, someone who provides, protects, and guides you. I miss an altar where people can come and pray. I miss it. Some of you may be afraid of that. Say, oh, that's I don't. I'm not. That's our pride speaking. Man, imagine what it'd be like in God's house if everybody fell on their face and said, Oh God, help me to become the person of faith that can really allow you to be my shepherd and therefore not one. Let's bow our heads this morning. Just a simple psalm, Lord the way most of us think of it. So powerful. It's that first verse, Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> I shall not want. God, when I see sheep out in the pasture, they have no want for anything. You've provided for them everything that they need. And Lord, you promised us that you would take care of us. But we confess to you, Lord, as a people that many times we leave you out of the equation and we worry ourselves sick and it changes nothing. Lord, help us to be the kind of people that gives our problems to you and walks away with the joy in our heart of knowing that someone who cares for us and can take about it, take care of it, Lord, has it. And show you our worship of you by walking away with comfort in our heart. Help us to have that kind of faith. In Jesus' name.